trust in the Lord and do good. May the Lord give strength to the people. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is our refuge and our strength. Good morning and welcome to Spencer United Methodist Church this morning. And good morning to all of you watching online across the South Hills Partnership and beyond. Um, it's good to be with all of you today. Um, to open with some announcements, things are largely the same as they were last week. Um, Bible study continues on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We're getting to the middle of Acts, chapter 9 of Acts. We're starting to talk about um, Paul, where Paul was introduced to Jesus on the road to Damascus um, and starting to read about uh, Paul's ministry, the beginning of Paul's ministry. If you'd like to join us at any time, feel free. Um, contact myself or Dave Smoyer and we'll get you on there. Um, prayer calls with Pastor Diane are continuing on Tuesdays at 7 p.m., except for this Tuesday. She's still on vacation, so they'll resume next week. Um, and contact her if you'd like to be included there. Um, she'll teach you how to do that. Um, and finally, with regards to Hilltop and Fairhaven, um, Hilltop was going to reevaluate today, um, whether they're going to reopen um, imminently. They decided based on like some informal polling of the congregation, not yet. Um, and Fairhaven will be having that discussion soon as well. Um, as always, online worship will continue indefinitely. Um, we're working on making that better continuously. Um, David Graham's been looking into it. I've been looking into it. Um, we want to have this as something that can be permanent and accessible anytime people can't be in church. All right, if you'll join me now in the opening prayer. Glorious God, your generosity fills the whole world with goodness, and you shower creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for food to satisfy both body and heart, that in the miracle of being fed, we may be empowered to feed the hungry. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing from Fairhaven's Craig Davis.
thank you as always to Craig um, for that gift to the partnership. Um, that is one of my favorite hymns, and I think always makes a good opening prayer as we ask God to open a fountain, um, to speak to us today, to heal our hearts over this long week. We'll pray together now the words of Psalm 17 in our hearts, um, verses 1 through 7 and then verse 15. Listen to what's right, Lord. Pay attention to my cry. Listen closely to my prayer. It's spoken by lips that don't lie. My justice comes from you. Let your eyes see what is right. You have examined my heart, testing me at night. You've looked over me closely but haven't found anything wrong. My mouth doesn't sin. But these other people's deeds, I have avoided such violent ways by the command from your lips. My steps are set firmly on your path. My feet haven't slipped. I cry out to you because you answer me. So tilt your ears toward me now. Listen to what I'm saying. Manifest your faithful love in amazing ways because you are the one who saves those who take refuge in you, saving them from attackers by your strong hand. But me, I will see your face in righteousness. When I awake, I will be filled full by seeing your image. As we continue to pray and to worship God, let's join now in these words of confession of sin. O King enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory, holy is your name, Lord God Almighty. In our sinfulness, we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips to speak your word, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these words of pardon. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself, and cleanse us from all our sins, that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, we'll move into the prayers of the people. Um, I have a few to share that I've received last week and this week, um, and then I'll certainly open the floor as well. For those of you who are watching online, of course, feel free to type them in the comment box, um, and we will read those and pray over those and um, include them in next week's service as well. Um, we continue to pray for the Vetterly family and all for all the friends of Howard Vetterly. His funeral was here um, Friday morning, and despite how strange everything has been, how difficult funerals are right now especially. It was a beautiful moment um, for the Hilltop Church and for all of those um, in this community that loved Howard. Um, and he was widely beloved. I mean, spent every day at Frank and Shirley's for at least a couple hours. They sent him a blanket. Um, and I believe sent a couple people that worked there here too. Um, he had all kinds of visitors from the VFW. It was a very beautiful, moving service. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate there, um, but continue to pray for Hilltop especially. Um, Kat gave birth yesterday um, to a new baby named Natasha Ruth. Um, born a little bit early. Did I miss that? Say that again. Karen. <laughs> Natasha. Natasha Karen. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Born a little bit early, but born healthy, and they'll be home tomorrow. Um, we continue to pay, pray for Paige Schonkweiler as she recovers from surgery. Um, for Brett, for Kirk, for Bo, who had a leg amputation, and for Harry Reedshaw. Um, he has a surgery scheduled now for his back, which will be in mid-August, at which point he'll be get, beginning chemo for leukemia lymphoma and should be on good track there. Um, I'd ask that we continue to pray for Orlando Green, um, who was, I brought up last week, he was recently evicted from his home just about a block from here, um, and is now seeking housing. He lost a lot of stuff in that eviction. I mean, um, staying with some relatives now, so definitely pray for Orlando. Um, and then the Coxons, along with um, various others throughout churches in the region and the South Hills Interfaith Mission, um, are working on creating a feeding program or doing some sort of mission at the Prospect Park apartment complex in Baldwin. So we continue to pray for that effort that it may be fruitful. Um, what else? 
I don't think I have anything else written down. I'd ask that you pray for um, Margie Scalos and for her family. She's in Michigan right now. Um, her sister, Judy, passed away um, earlier this week, and she's up there for the funeral. Um, and Margie has also asked us to pray for Katie, who is her sister Judy's daughter. Um, she had a kidney removed for kidney cancer recently, but the cancer has spread um, and is now in her lungs as well. So Katie is, is having a very hard time, and we would lift up the whole Scalos family and all of Margie's family as well. Anything else? Oh, also, um, Harriet Davis um, had two dogs until recently. One passed away earlier um, this summer, and the other one just passed away this week. And I know that she's been having a hard time. So we pray for Harriet Davis as well. Did you have something, Cheryl? Yeah, uh, Bo, who had the leg amputation, died on Wednesday. Oh. His dinner on uh, Tuesday. Okay. First for his family. Okay. And um, my cousin Candy was thrown from a horse. She has some pretty serious injuries, but she's hanging in there, but she needs prayers. Okay. You said Candy? Candy. Bo, who had the leg amputation last week, did pass away this week, is what Cheryl said. Um, and then Candy um, was thrown off a horse and had some injuries, but is doing okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, what is today? Today's the second. Um, the international church that is pastored by Joel Dumba is going to be starting to meet here once a month, starting on the 15th. Um, they're having sort of an opening um, service on the 15th where their bishop will be speaking and Joel is very excited for that for this new chapter in their ministry so I'd ask that you lift up um, that church as they prepare to worship in this space too okay nothing else then let's go before God in prayer dear Lord we thank you that as we come before you with empty hands and oftentimes with heavy hearts, that you stand ready to feed us, to give us living water to satisfy the hungry heart and the thirsty soul. Help us this day, in this hour, to drink in the refreshment of your faithfulness. As we get this rare opportunity to be together, Help us to see your face in one another. Help us to feel your grace in the songs that are played. Help us to fully fling wide the doors of our hearts to worship you now. We come before you to present ourselves as an offering and as a sacrifice. And in that spirit, we offer up the names of so many in need, placing them before your throne of grace that they may be healed, that they may be restored, that they may be comforted in your arms. Particularly, we lift up the Betterly family and for all those who knew and loved Howard at Hilltop Church and beyond. We lift up Orlando that he may find stability, that he may find housing soon, and that all of those who are put in a precarious position by this virus and by this economic crunch may receive justice, stability, home. We lift up Brett and Kirk, Paige, Candy. We lift up Perry Reedshaw. and Bo and his family after he's died in the wake of this surgery. Hold them close to you, O oh Lord. We ask that you draw near to Harriet in her time of difficulty. And at the same time, we lift up great joy for Kat's new baby, Natasha for all the moments of joy that peek through. We thank you for these little visions of your grace that we receive. 
we ask that you open our eyes to see all of the joy and all of the blessings that you place before us. And that as we see each and every one of these, we may give thanks to you and all praise to you for everything that you give to us generously every day. From our first breath in the morning to our last before we fall asleep, all is a gift from you. We are so grateful to be your children, O oh Lord, and reconciled to you by the life, the death, and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn of praise is a performance by David Graham this week, and is He Knows My Name. First reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, uh, chapter 55, verses 1 through 5. All of you who are thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has no money, come buy food and eat. Without money at no cost, buy wine and milk. Why spend money for what isn't food and your earnings for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Enjoy the richest of feasts. Listen and come to me. Listen and you will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful loyalty to David. Look, I made him a witness to the peoples, a prince and a commander of peoples. Look, you will call a nation you don't know. A nation you don't know will run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, who has glorified you. Our gospel lesson today 
comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. When Jesus heard about John, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. When the crowds learned this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion for them and healed those who were sick. That evening, his disciples came and said to him, This is an isolated place, and it is getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, There's no need to send them away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here except five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. He ordered the crowds to sit down in the grass. He took the five loaves of bread and the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them and broke the loaves apart and gave them to his disciples. Then the disciples gave them to the crowds. Everyone ate until they were full, and they filled 12 baskets with the leftovers. About 5,000 men plus women and children had eaten. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. Dear God, grant that the humble word that I bring before these people today and before you today, and that the gifts of all of our hearts that we humbly bring before you today may be multiplied to feed the masses, to build your kingdom in this place and beyond. Come, Holy Spirit to warm our hearts, to open them and set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been thinking a lot, especially as we study the book of Acts on Wednesday, about how the gospel and the power of Jesus Christ consistently draws crowds to the disciples. People see something in them. They see something that they don't see anywhere else, and it's attractive. They see the power of God moving in a real and tangible way, and they can't help but chase that. The same is true before the book of Acts of Jesus himself. People of all walks of life see him or simply hear about him and just need to go find him, need to go chase after him. He brings out this sort of raw honesty in people about their deepest needs that we rarely see in our own lives among other people. They chase him because in some way their life is incomplete or lacking. Our modern American way of life is instead to just plug along. Every person an island, you know the expression, working hard, glossing over the deepest struggles and the crises of our lives to make sure we don't burden anyone else with even our most desperate needs even as holes open up in our souls and our hearts, we step back. If I ask, how are you doing? I'm 99% sure you're going to say something like, fine, thank you, and you, regardless of the level of truth that actually contains. I mean, this is starting to break down during the pandemic because, you know, nobody's really fine anymore, so we can admit that. But still, I'm fine, you're fine, thank you, I hope you have a good day. And if you do say something that really diverges from that and break this ritual, you'll get a funny look from a person who definitely wasn't expecting it. So imagine instead that we started answering that question truthfully one day. Our day-to-day -day lives would break down. Things would become a whole lot less efficient. How quickly could you get through shop and save or even out of church if every time you ask someone how they are doing today, they really told you. They told you how they're feeling today, and then they told you all the backstory as well. Illness, heartbreak, depression, anxiety, spiritual pain, doubt, injustice, debt, hunger. The way we structure our encounters with people around us prevents things like that from coming to the surface. Prevents them from filling the space in between two people rather than just weighing on the heart of one of them. That level of vulnerability is really uncomfortable. 
And society keeps on moving a whole lot more smoothly when everyone keeps their problems to themselves. Systems, or as Paul would call them, powers and principalities that cause people a lot of pain carry on a lot more smoothly, too, if no one really talks about them, if we just kind of set them aside. Consider, after all, that this past week, pandemic unemployment insurance ended, something that's kept millions of families afloat while the unemployment rate is hitting Great Depression levels and the economy has shrunk by like 30%. Soon the eviction moratorium is expected to end as well. Um, as I said, I saw my first eviction the other day, which was kind of a sketchy loophole. Um, but there are estimates that almost half of Pennsylvania's renters will be at risk of becoming homeless. There's going to be a flood of suffering. I mean, there's already a flood of suffering. That's kind of been the baseline of this pandemic. But still, these polite smiles fill in instead, even when the world feels like it's collapsing around us. There's a German theologian named Jürgen Moltmann who asked the question, what does it mean to recall the God who was crucified in a society whose official creed is optimism and which is knee-deep in blood? But this is the everyday miracle of Jesus' ministry like we see in the gospel text today. He shatters these surface-level relationships of our world and opens up space for real encounters between people and between people and God. So Christ, who would empty himself even to death on a cross, constantly opens himself up to the pain and the suffering of those around him every day of his life. Jesus, I'm pretty sure, would have trouble getting through the grocery store in a reasonable amount of time. He had trouble getting anywhere in a reasonable amount of time. He was rarely able to make it across a field in the middle of nowhere without being mobbed by these needy crowds. You read the story today, and I didn't actually notice this until reading it just now again. He went to this deserted place to pray, to be alone. And the people were already there. When people see Christ, whether physically or on the shores of Galilee or through Christ's presence in us now, the floodgates just open and the deepest needs of people's bodies and souls pour out. The crowds that gather around Jesus are not people who are fine, thank you, but who acknowledge their real neediness to the extent that they wander out into the wilderness in desperation, hoping that this strange man from Nazareth can do something for them. And it turns out their hope is not a misplaced hope at all. Jesus steps in not just with sympathy to hear the pain and despair, which is a miracle in itself. We don't really spend time doing that. But in solidarity with them, he takes their burdens upon himself as his own, even unto death on a cross. This sort of solidarity, this sitting in the suffering, leads us to where we find Jesus in the gospel text today, on this hillside above the Sea of Galilee. And we should remember, too, as all of this is going on, that the um, verses before this in chapter 14 of, of Matthew talk about that John the Baptist had just been executed. Jesus' own cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded for being a prophet by King Herod. So Jesus goes out to this isolated place to find some time alone to pray, to mourn his own cousin. He's withdrawn to pray by himself, to be alone, to process the news, and Yet we see this image of a shepherd. Jesus is trudging up the skinny goat path, winding up a rocky cliff maybe, and even there, thousands of people like days, like dingy sheep, gather around him, murmuring to one another, maybe just walking in silence themselves. The Lord is their shepherd. They've heard his voice, they've placed, himself, they've placed themselves in his care. These sheep are incapable of living on their own, as sheep always are, and are honest enough to admit that. And they follow behind the one that they know can make them whole. This story, like so many others in the Gospels, I see Jesus dealing with what I'd consider a don't feed the bears scenario. He's continually healed people, cast out their demons, and worked great miracles. 
to the point where people not begin to only want it, but to expect it. To expect that he can and he will. Jesus has set up the expectation that he is going to intervene. But their trust is never misplaced. The shepherd, in the words of Psalm 23, decides that they shall not want. The abruptness of this conversation between Jesus and his disciples when all of these lost sheep arrive is pretty startling when you slow down to hear it again. Listen to these words from Matthew. When Jesus heard about John, he withdrew in a deserted place by himself. When the crowds learned this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion for them and healed those who were sick. That evening, his disciples came and said to him, this is an isolated place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, there's no need to send them away. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Jesus doesn't entertain a whisper of questioning whether or not the people should be fed. That doesn't even cross his mind. There's no debate. What do we do with these people? There's no debate about the people's worthiness, whether they deserve it, whether they really ought to be able to fend for themselves, as the disciples seem to offer. Or even why on earth Jesus and the disciples would owe dinner to a crowd of 5,000 random people that followed them where they didn't want to be followed. Instead, Jesus orders the disciples to feed them, which is an absurdity for 13 traveling preachers who rely solely on the generosity of others to feed themselves. You give them something to eat. There's a need in the crowd, and for Jesus, it has to be met. It's not an option. In John's gospel, we hear another account of this story, maybe a better known one. And John adds some more details. We're told the apostle Philip does some quick mental math here. And he estimates that it would be more than six months wages, presumably all 13 of them working six whole months, just to buy enough bread for this one single meal. And you know the disciples in Matthew's version were obviously thinking the same thing. I mean, how were they going to pay for that? 5,000 people worth of food. Can you imagine trying to do, you know, if the Swiss steak dinner was for 5,000 people, what kind of investment would it take to get that much food and prepare it and have it ready? So how will they pay for it? Isn't that a familiar question? And I wonder what we ask it about and what we don't ask it about, because it's coming up in this story. You know, at a national level, we rarely hear questions about whether a trillion dollars for a new fighter jet is affordable. But anytime we talk about less than 1% of that to feed those who have no bread, that's framed as frivolous year after year. And that's not at a national level. That's not just a political thing either. For a church example, in one college town church that I attended, the very same year, this might have been the very same council meeting, that the church decided to cut the college and youth minister position. And again, this was in a college town. I mean, college students are in pretty urgent need of having the church reach out to them. And amidst this ongoing, painful economic decline in the next town over, they cut that position. But the congregation managed to scrape up $50,000 over the course of a few months to enlarge their pipe organ, since every other downtown church had a bigger one than theirs. The Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, the Baptists, all of them had a nicer organ. And that, they lived with that shame for 100 years, you know, and it was time to overcome it. Sometimes it seems like we can manage to easily scoot past the pragmatic question of how can we afford it, if it's something that we really want. But other times, I think it functions as a handy escape hatch from something we'd rather not do anyway. Now, I'm certain that the disciples had no idea how they were going to feed these people. But I also wonder, from their tone, whether they weren't all that interested in doing it anyway. 
But Jesus, knowing that the disciples are at a loss, calmly makes these 5,000 sheep to lie down in the green pasture. He asks for the five loaves and the two fish that the apostles have on them. And you know they would have been distressed about that because it was just barely going to provide a snack for the 13 of them. Barely a dinner, and it, this amount of food would be meaningless spread out over this large crowd. What's everybody going to get a crumb? I mean, why would we give away the meal that we have that was going to be kind of enough for us whenever it's going to be meaningless for all these people? But Jesus takes it. He blesses this small amount of food, and he hands it back to the disciples, telling them to hand it out. I mean, this must have been like double the slap in the face. Not only are we getting dinner, not, not getting dinner, we're going to have to make a joke of handing out this amount of bread and fish to all of these people. You know, I don't know if you've ever handed out communion from a loaf, but sometimes you have the experience of the loaf being like very obviously too small for how many people are left in line. And you just keep tearing off smaller and smaller pieces, hoping that you don't run out. And that's what I picture the disciples feeling like in this. But instead, they find out that no matter how much they hand out, no matter how big a chunk of bread you rip off and hand to the next kid in line, their supply of bread and fish doesn't decrease. Every bit of generosity that they give, no matter how extravagant it is, is met with an even more extravagant blessing from God. The disciples were hesitant to give away their own dinner, yet finished feeding a crowd of over 5,000 people with 12 baskets of food to spare. So they wouldn't have even had a whole loaf of bread for each of them with the amount that they originally had. But they finished this each, and I'm sure Jesus thought this was kind of funny, with a whole basket of food. Something that's easy to miss, too, in this story because of the way it's translated. 5,000 men were present. And, you know, I think uh, Matthew puts it in women and children beside. They really only numbered the men. So conceivably, there could have been three times that many people and 12 baskets of food to spare. There's long been two ways of thinking about this story, and you've probably heard them both. I mean, we hear the loaves and fishes fairly frequently. The first option is, is it a supernatural work of God? Did God multiply the apostles' small supply into enough for 5,000 people? Or did Jesus' radical, faithful generosity motivate all of those in the crowd who might have already had more than enough to share with those who had nothing, and it turned out there was enough all along? A lot of people read it that way, that some of the people who followed Jesus did bring dinner, and it turned out there was enough for everybody. Whichever way it goes, I don't think either of those options matter all that much because the point of the story is that God can do it either way. And we still can today. When we lay down all that we have to offer, God will make it enough. A baby step of faithfulness sets into motion this waterfall of God's blessing as the wind of the Holy Spirit picks us up, takes hold of us, and moves us beyond where we thought we could go. When there's a crowd of 5,000 hungry sheep following along behind us, desperate for a blessing to fill empty hearts or bellies, I don't think we have the luxury to say that we can't afford it. When we're confronted by human pain, human need, that somehow bursts through these polite veneers that we've constructed, we can't turn away from that. It's so rare for need to really come through. And when it does, we don't get to turn away from it. We're not able to say there's no food for the hungry. The disciples weren't allowed, neither are we. We're not able to say there's no freedom for the captive, no liberation for the oppressed, no sight for the blind, no good news for the poor, no space for those who have no home, no grace for the sinner. Jesus' first sermon suggests that we don't have the opportunity to say any of those things because God declares that there is Whenever all any of us has is due only to God's grace, we don't get to say there's not enough for anybody. As we recklessly distribute the abundance of God's mercy, Jesus ensures that not even the crumbs are wasted. 
in this story, we see Jesus standing in the place of Moses. You know, Moses, as the Israelites are wandering in the Sinai, calls down manna from heaven for them to eat as they're wandering. You know, this bread substance, the sweet bread that comes from heaven to cover the ground every morning, just enough for them to eat day by day. But the Hebrews were not allowed to save more manna than they could eat. The story we find in, in Exodus is if they saved too much, God said it would go bad. It would get rats and all kinds of things in it. It would go bad immediately. They weren't allowed to hoard it. Jesus shares so abundantly that the disciples need a dozen baskets to pick up the excess and tells them to pick it up. He's saying my bread is even more than manna. I have so much that there is an overflow, an overflow that you can keep. God's blessing through Christ is overabundant. It's more than they need, more than they could expect. Not only is there enough, there's more than enough for all, whether it comes purely from our own cupboards and wallets and hearts flying open, or if God actually supernaturally multiplies it as there's need. There will be baskets and baskets of overflow when we pour out all we have for God's people. And not a crumb of it will go to waste. May Isaiah's invitation to God's feast be ours too, shared with the people around us and the people all around the world. All of you who are thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has no money, come, buy food and eat. Without money, at no cost, buy wine and milk. Why spend money for what isn't food and your earnings for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Enjoy the richest of feasts. Listen and come to me. Listen and you will live. There's always enough. From five loaves, from two fishes, from whatever we have to hand over to God. There is always enough. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you join me now in affirming our faith in this God, who blesses us and who blesses the world with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The offering plate, as always, is outside the door. I know a lot of you dropped yours off on your way in, um, and you're welcome to do it on the way out as well. Um, for those of you who are watching online and who aren't here today, if you choose to give your tithes and offerings to the South Hills Partnership Church of your choice, um, all of them are accepting tithes and offerings by mail. Um, the mailing address for each can be found at shpumc.org, or if you just Google the name of the church, um, the address will come up. Our financial secretaries have been taking good care um, this whole time, as all of you have remained faithful to taking care of these churches. At this time, I'd like to bless those offerings together and lift them up as a, as a sacrifice and an offering to God. Pray with me, please. All things come from you, O God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so in gratitude for all your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Savior.
as has become our pandemic era tradition, um, the ushers will dismiss you from back to front. Go forth into the world, confident that the God who graciously provides for all of us will make whatever we have enough. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.